The Edict of Caesar Augustus is published, commanding all subjects of the empire to registrate, and what St. Joseph did when he heard of it. It had been decreed by the immutable will of Providence that the only begotten of the Father should be born in the town of Bethlehem, and accordingly it had been foretold by the saints and prophets of foregone ages, Jeremiah 10, 9, for the decrees of the absolute will of God are infallible, and since, since nothing can resist them, Esther 13.9, sooner would heaven and earth pass away than that they fail of accomplishment, Matthew 24.35. The fulfillment of this immutable decree, the Lord secured by means of an edict of Caesar Augustus for the whole Roman Empire, ordering the registration or enumeration of all the world, as St. Luke says, Luke 2.1. The Roman Empire at that time embraced the greater part of what was then known of the earth, and therefore they called themselves masters of the world, ignoring all the other nations. The object of this census was to make all the inhabitants acknowledge themselves as vassals of the emperor, and to pay a certain tax to their temporal lord. For this registration, everyone was to go to his native city in order to be inscribed. This edict was also proclaimed in Nazareth and came to the hearing of St. Joseph while he was on some errand. He returned to his house in sorrowful consternation and informed his heavenly spouse of the news which had spread about concerning the edict. The most prudent virgin answered, quote, Let not this edict of our temporal ruler cause thee any concern, my master and spouse, for all that happens to us is ordained by the Lord and King of heaven and earth, and in all events his providence will assist and direct us. Ecclesiastes 22:28. Let us resign ourselves into his hands, and we shall not be disappointed. Unquote. Most Holy Mary was capable of being entrusted with all the mysteries of her Most Holy Son, and she knew of the prophecies and their fulfillment. Hence, also, that the only begotten of the Father and her own was to be born in Bethlehem, a stranger and an unknown. But she said nothing of this to St. Joseph, for without being commissioned by the Lord, she would reveal none of his secrets. All that she was not commanded to reveal, she concealed with admirable prudence, notwithstanding her desire of consoling her most faithful and holy spouse. She wished to entrust herself to his direction and arrangement without acting the part of those who are wise in their own conceit, as wisdom warns us. Proverbs 3.7 they therefore conferred with each other about the course to be pursued, <clears throat> for already the pregnancy of the heavenly lady was far advanced and her paturation was approaching. St. Joseph said, quote, Queen of heaven and earth and my mistress, if thou hast no order on the, to the contrary from the Almighty, it seems to me necessary that I go alone. Yet although this order refers only to the heads of families, I dare not leave thee without assistance, nor could I live without thee nor would I have a moment's peace away from thee, for my heart could not come to any rest without seeing thee. Thy heavenly delivery is too imminent to ask thee to go with me to Bethlehem, whither this edict calls us. And I fear to place thee in any risk, as well on account of the condition, as also on account of my poverty, of thy condition, as also on account of my poverty. If thy delivery should happen on the way, amid inconveniences, which I could not alleviate, I would be heartbroken. These are the anxious thoughts which trouble me. I pray thee, lady, present them before the Most High, and beseech him to grant me my desire of not being separated from thee. His humble spouse obeyed St. Joseph, and although she was not ignorant of the divine will, yet she would not omit this act of obedience as a most submissive spouse. She presented to the Lord the fervent wishes of St. Joseph and received the following answer, quote, My dearest dove, yield to the wishes of my servant Joseph and what he proposes. Accompany him on the journey. I shall be with thee, and I shall assist thee with paternal love in the tribulations which thou shalt suffer for my sake, although they shall be very great. My powerful arms will make thee come forth glorious from all of them. Thy footsteps will be beautiful in my sight. Canticle 7.1 do not fear, since this is my will, unquote. Then the Lord gave to the holy guardian angels in the presence of the heavenly Mary a new and special command and precept that they serve her during this journey with particular care and solicitude as befitted the magnificent mysteries that should be transacted. Beside the thousand angels which served ordinarily as her guard, the Lord commanded other nine thousand to attend 
on their queen and mistress and serve as a guard of honor, ten thousand strong from the first day of her journey. This they did as most faithful servants of the Lord, as I shall say later on. The great queen was renewed and strengthened with new enlightenment for the troubles and tribulations which would be occasioned by the persecution of Herod and other happenings at the birth of the infant God. Matthew 2.16 Her invincible heart being thus prepared, she offered herself to the Lord without any disquietude and gave thanks for all that she, he should choose to do and arrange in regard to these future events. She returned from this heavenly interview to St. Joseph and announced to him the will of the Most High, that she accede to his wishes and accompany him on his journey to Bethlehem. Joseph was filled with new consolation and delight, acknowledging the great favor conferred upon him by the right hand of the Most High. He gave thanks with fervent acts of gratitude and humility, and addressing the heavenly spouse, he answered, quote, My lady, source of my happiness and good fortune, the only cause of grief in this journey will now be the hardships which thou must undergo, because I have no riches to procure thee the conveniences which I would like to furnish for thy pilgrimage. But we shall find relations, acquaintances, and friends of our family in Bethlehem. I hope they will receive us hospitably, and there thou canst rest from the exertions of the journey. If the Lord will dispose as I thy servant would wish." Unquote. Thus the Holy Spouse, St. Joseph, lovingly planned, but the Lord had already prearranged all things in a way unknown to him, and therefore he experienced so much the greater bitterness of disappointment when all his loving expectations failed, as we shall see. Most Holy Mary said nothing to St. Joseph of what she knew the Lord had decreed concerning the heavenly birth, although she well knew that it would be different from what he expected. She rather encouraged him, saying, quote, My spouse and master, I accompany thee with much pleasure, and we will make this journey as poor people in the name of the Lord. For the Most High will not despise poverty, which he came to seek with so much love. Relying on his protection and assistance in our necessities and labors, we will proceed with confidence. Do thou, my master, place to, the, to his account all thy difficulties. Unquote. They at the same time resolved upon the day of their departure, and Joseph diligently searched in the town of Nazareth, Nazareth for some beast of burden to bear the mistress of the world. He could not easily find one, because so many people were going to different towns in order to fulfill the requirements of the edict of the emperor. But after much anx anxious inquiry, St. Joseph found an unpretentious little beast, which, if we can call such creatures fortunate, was the most fortunate of all the irrational animals, since it was privileged not only to bear the queen of all creation and the blessed fruit of her womb, the king of kings and the lord of lords, but afterwards to be present at his birth. Isaiah 1, 3, and since it gave to its creator the homage denied to him by men, as I shall relate. They provided the articles for the journey, which would last five days. The outfit of the heavenly travelers was the same as that which they had provided for their previous journey to the house of Zacharias on their visit to Elizabeth. They carried with them bread, fruit, and some fishes, which ordinarily composed their nourishment. As the most prudent virgin was enlightened regarding their protracted absence, she made use of prudent concealment in taking along the linens and clothes necessary for her heavenly delivery, for she wished to dispose all things according to the exalted intentions of the Lord in preparation for the events she expected. Their house they left in charge of some neighbor until they should return. The day and hour for their departure for Bethlehem arrived, and because of the reverence with which the most faithful and fortunate Joseph had begun to treat his sovereign spouse, he diligently and anxiously sought to do all in his power to please her. He besought her with great affection to make known to him all her wishes, and to call his attention to all that he might forget in regard to her pleasure, convenience, and comfort, <clears throat> or that might please the Lord whom she bore in her womb. The humble queen thanked him for his loving attention, and referring it all to referring it to all the glory and service of her most holy son. She consoled and animated him to meet courageously the hardships of the journey, assuring him anew that the Almighty was pleased with his affectionate solicitude. <coughs> she also informed him of the will of his majesty that they meet with patience and joy of heart the hardships of poverty on their way. In order to begin her journey, the Empress of Heaven knelt at the feet of St. Joseph and asked him for his blessing. 
although the man of God shrunk from such a request and strenuously objected on account of the dignity of his spouse, she nevertheless remained victorious in her humility and prevailed upon him to give her his benediction. St. Joseph complied with great timidity and reverence and immediately cast himself at her feet in a flood of tears, asking her to present him anew to her most holy son and obtain for him divine pardon and grace. Oh. Thus prepared, they started from Nazareth for Bethlehem in midwinter, which made the journey more painful and difficult. But the mother of God, who bore the eternal life within her, attended solely to the divine activities and colloquies of the Lord, observing him in the virginal chamber of her womb, imitating him in his works, and giving him more delight and honor than all the rest of creatures taken together. Instruction which Most Holy Mary the Queen vouchsafed to me windy and I have the doors open so my daughter <clears throat> in all thy discourse on my life and in each of the chapters and mysteries so far rehearsed thou wilt find the admirable providence of the most high and his fatherly love toward me his humble servant although human capacity cannot fully penetrate and estimate the admirable works of such high wisdom Yet it must venerate it with all its powers, and must seek to participate in the favors which the Lord showed me by striving to imitate me. <clears throat> For mortals must not think that only for my sake and in me God wished to show himself as holy, powerful, and infinitely good. It is certain that if any or all of the souls would entrust themselves to the direction and government of this Lord, they would soon experience that same fidelity, punctuality, and most sweet efficacy with which His Majesty arranged all things that touched upon His honor and service in my life. They would likewise taste those delightful and divine emotions which I felt in relying upon His most holy will, nor would they fail to receive the abundance of His gifts, which are enclosed as in an infinite ocean within His divinity. And just as the waters of the ocean rush forth wherever they find a suitable opening, so the graces and blessings of the Lord overflow upon rational creatures when they are well disposed and do not hinder their course. This truth is hidden to mortals because they do not stop to ponder and consider the works of the Almighty. I desire, I desire thee to study this truth, to write it within thy heart, and to learn from my own actions the secret workings of thy own interior, so that thou understand what goes on within thee. Also, that thou practice ready obedience and subjection to others, always preferring the good counsels of others to thy own insignificant, uh, I'm sorry, to thy own insight and judgment. Thou must carry this to such a point that, in order to obey thy superiors and thy spiritual directors, thou take no notice of what thou foreseest will happen, contrary to their expectations. Just as I, when I knew that what my holy spouse Joseph expected would not happen on our journey to Bethlehem, and even when some equal or inferior command thee such things, be silent and hide thy better foreknowledge, perform all that is no sin or imperfection. Listen to all with attention and silence, so that thou mayest learn, in speaking, be slow and reserved, for in this consists prudent and careful intercourse. Always bear in mind that thou ask the blessing of the Lord for all that thou wishest to undertake, in order that thou mayest not wonder from what is pleasing to him. Whenever, that, whenever thou hast an opportunity, ask also the permission and blessing of thy spiritual father and director, so that thou mayest not fall short of the greatest merits and perfections in thy works, and in order that thou mayest also give, the pleasure, give me the pleasure which I desire of thee. <clears throat> the journey of Most Holy Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem in the company of the Holy Spouse Joseph and of the Holy Guardian Angels. The Most Pure Mary and the Glorious Saint Joseph departed from Nazareth for Bethlehem alone, poor and humble in the eyes of the world. None of the mortals thought more of them than what was warranted by their poverty and humility. But, oh, the wonderful sacraments of the Most High, hidden to the proud and unpenetrated by the wisdom of the flesh, they did not walk alone, poor or despised, but prosperous, rich, and in magnificence. They were most worthy of the immense love of the Eternal Father, and most esteemable in His eyes. They carried with them the treasure of heaven, the deity itself. The whole court of the celestial ministers venerated them. 
All the inanimate beings recognize the living and true Ark of the Testament. Josu 3.16 More readily than the waters of the Jordan recognized its type and shadow when they courteously laid open and free the path for its passage and for those that followed it. <coughs> they were accompanied by the ten thousand angels which was which, as mentioned, were appointed by God himself as the servants of Her Majesty during the whole journey. These heavenly squadrons marched along as their retinue in human forms visible to the heavenly lady, more refulgent than so many suns. She herself walked in their midst, better guarded and defended than the bed of Solomon, surrounded by the sixty valiant ones of Israel, girded with their swords. Canticles 3.7 Besides these ten thousand angels, there were many others who descended from heaven as messengers of the Eternal Father to His only begotten made man in His most holy mother, and who ascended from earth as their ambassadors with messages and treaties from them, them to the Heavenly Father. In the midst of this royal retinue, hidden from the gaze of men, most holy Mary and Joseph proceeded on their way, secure that their feet would not be bruised by the stone of tribulation. Psalms 40.12 since the Lord had commanded his angels to be their defense and watchfulness. This command the most faithful ministers as vassals of their queen, great queen fulfilled with wonder and delight, seeing centered in a mere creature such great sacraments, such perfections, and immense, immense treasures of the divinity, and seeing in her all this distinction united to dignity and grace far exceeding their own angelic capacity. They composed new songs in honor of the Lord, <coughs> whom they saw reclining as the highest king of glory on his throne of gold, Canticles 3, 9, and in honor of the heavenly mother, who was like his living and incorruptible chariot, or like the fertile ear of corn of the promised land, enclosing the living grain, Leviticus 23, 10, or like the rich merchant ship, which brings the grain to the house of bread in order that dying in the earth it might be multiplied for heaven. John twelve twenty four. Their journey lasted five days, <coughs> for on account of the pregnancy of his spouse, St. Joseph shortened each day's journey. The Sovereign Queen experienced no darkness of night on the way, for a few times, when their travel extended beyond nightfall, the holy angels spread about such effulgence as not all the lights of heaven in their noontide, noontide splendor would have thrown forth in the clearest heavens. This light and vision of the angels also St. Joseph enjoyed at those times. Then all of them together would form celestial choirs in which they and the two holy travelers alternated in singing wonderful hymns and canticles of praise, converting the fields into new heavens. Wow. During this whole journey, the queen was rejoiced by the sight of her resplendent ministers and vassals and by the sweet interior conversation held with them. With these wonderful favors and delights, however, the Lord joined some hardships and inconveniences which the Divine Mother encountered on the way. For the concourse of people in the taverns, occasioned by the imperial, imperial, imperial sorry, edict, was very disagreeable and annoying to the modest and retiring virgin mother and her spouse. On account of their poverty and timid retirement, they were treated with less hospitality and consideration than others, especially the well-to-do, for the world judges and usually confers its favors according to outward appearances and according to personal influence. Our holy pilgrims were obliged repeatedly to listen to sharp reprimands, reprimands in the taverns, at which they arrived tired out by their journey, <clears throat> and in some of them they were refused admittance as worthless and despicable people. Several times they assigned to the mistress of heaven and earth some corner of the hallway, while at others she did not fare even so well, being obliged to retire with her husband to places still more humble and unbecoming in the estimation of the world. But in whatever places she tarried, how contemptible soever it might be considered, the courtiers of heaven established their court around their supreme king and sovereign queen. Immediately they surrounded and enclosed them like an impenetrable wall, securing the bridal chamber of Solomon against the terrors of the night. Her most faithful spouse, Joseph, seeing the mistress of heaven, 
so well guarded by the angelic host, betook himself to rest and sleep, for to this she urged him on account of the hardships of travel. She, however, continued her celestial colloquies with the ten thousand angels of her retinue. Solomon, in the Canticles, describes in diverse metaphors and similitudes many great mysteries of the Queen of Heaven, but in the third chapter he refers more particularly to what happened to the Heavenly Mother in her pregnancy and during this journey. During this time was fulfilled to the letter all that is said of the couch of Solomon, Canticles 3.7, of his char chariot and of his golden bed, of the guard which was stationed around it enjoying the divine vision, also all the other sayings which are contained in those prophecies. What I have pointed out will suffice to make them understood, and they should excite our admiration of the wonderful sacraments of God's activity for the good of man. Who is there among mortals whose heart is not softened, or who is so proud as, as not to be abashed, or so careless as not to be filled with wonder at such miraculous extremes? The infinite and true God, hidden and concealed in the vir virginal womb of a tender maiden, full of grace and beauty, innocent, pure, sweet, pleasing and amiable in the eyes of God and of men, surpassing all that the Lord God has ever or shall ever create. To see this great lady, bearing the treasure of the divinity, despised, persecuted, neglected, and cast out by the blind ignorance and pride of the world, and on the other hand, while she is thus pushed aside into the last places to see her loved and esteemed by the triune God, regaled by his caresses, served by his angels, revered, defended, and assisted with the greatest anxiety and watchfulness. O children of men, slow and hard of hearts, Psalms 4, 3, how deceitful are your ways and how erroneous is your judgment in esteeming the rich and despising the poor, James 2, 2 exalting the proud and humiliating the lowly, applauding the braggarts and casting out the just. Blind is your choice and full of error your judgment, and you will find yourselves frustrated in all your desires. Ambitiously you seek, reachers, you seek riches and treasures, and you find yourself in poverty beating the air. If you had received the true ark of God, you would have been blessed by the hand of the Almighty, like Obedidom. 2 Kings 6.11 But because you have treated it unworthily, many of you have experienced the punishment of Oza. The heavenly lady observed and knew the secrets of the different souls of those she met, penetrating into the very thoughts and conditions of each, whether of grace or of guilt in their different degrees. Concerning many souls, she also knew whether they were predestined or reprobate, whether they would persevere, fall, or again rise up. All this variety of insight moved her to the exercise of heroic virtues, as well in regard to the ones as to the others. For many of them she obtained the grace of perseverance. For others, efficacious help to rise from their sin to grace. For others, again, she prayed to the Lord with affectionate tears, feeling intensest sorrow for the reprobate, though she did not pray as efficaciously for them. Many times, worn out by these sorrows, much more than by the hardships of travel, the strength of her body gave way. On such occasions the holy angels, full of refulgent light and beauty, bore her up in their arms, in order that she might rest and recuperate. The sick, afflicted, and indigent whom she met on the way, she consoled and assisted by asking her most holy son to come to their aid and in their necessities and adversities. She kept herself silently aloof from the multitude, preoccupied with the fruit of her divine pregnancy, which was already evident to all. Such was the return which the Mother of Mercy made for the inhospita inhospitality of mortals. For the greater reproach of human ingratitude, it happened also that once during these wintry days they reached a stopping place in the midst of a cold rain and snowstorm, for the Lord did not spare them this inconvenience, and they were obliged to take shelter in the stables of the animals, because the owners would not furnish better accommodation. What? Okay. The irrational beasts showed them the courtesy and kindness which was refused by their human fellow beings, for they retreated in reverence at the entrance of their Maker and of his mother who carried him in her virginal womb. It is true the Queen of Creation could command the winds, the frost and the snow, not to inconvenience her, 
that she would not give such a command in order not to deprive herself of suffering. <clears throat> in imitation of her most holy son, even before he came forth into the world. Therefore the inclemencies of the weather affected her to a certain extent. <clears throat> the faithful St. Joseph, however, did his utmost to shield her, and still more did the holy angels seek to protect her, especially the holy prince Michael, who remained at the right side of his queen without leaving her, even for a moment. Wow. Several times when she became tired, he led her by the arm along the way. Whenever the Lord permitted, he also shielded her against the weather and performed many other services for the heavenly queen and the blessed fruit of her womb, Jesus. That's so neat. Thus, variously and wonderfully assisted, our travelers arrived at the town of Bethlehem at four o'clock on the fifth day, a Saturday. As it was at the time of the winter solstice, the sun was already sinking, and the night was falling. They entered the town and wandered through many streets in search of a lodging house or inn for staying overnight. They knocked at the doors of their acquaintances and near family relations, <clears throat> but they were admitted nowhere, and in many places they met with harsh words and insults. The most modest queen followed her spouse through the crowds of people, while he went from house to house and from door to door. Although she knew that the hearts and the houses of men were to be closed to them, and although to expose her state at her, her age to expose her state at her age to the public gaze was more painful to her modesty than their failure to procure a night lodging, she nevertheless wished to obey St. Joseph and suffer this indignity and unmerited shame. While wandering through the streets, they passed the office of the public registry, and they inscribed their names and paid the fiscal tribute in order to comply with the edict and not be obliged to return. <coughs> Excuse me. They continued their already. They continued their search, betaking themselves to the, to other houses, but having already applied at more than fifty different places, they found themselves rejected and sent away from them all. The heavenly spirits were filled with astonishment at these exalted mysteries of the Most High, which manifested the patience and meekness of His Virgin Mother and the unfeeling hardness of men. At the same time, they blessed the Almighty in His works and hidden sacraments, since from that day on He began to exalt and honor poverty and humility among men. It was nine o'clock at night when the most faithful Joseph, full of bitter and heart-rending sorrow, returned to his most prudent spouse and said, quote, my sweetest lady, my heart is broken with sorrow at the thought of not, on, of not only not being able to shelter thee as thou deservest and as I desire, but in not being able to offer thee even any kind of protection from the weather or a place of rest, a thing rarely or never denied to the most poor and despised in the world. No doubt heaven, in thus allowing the hearts of men to be so unmoved as to refuse us a night lodging, conceals some mystery. I now remember, lady, that outside the city walls there is a cave, which serves as a shelter for shepherds and their flocks. Let us seek it out. Perhaps it is unoccupied, and we may there expect some assistance from heaven, since we receive none from men on earth." Unquote. <coughs> the most prudent virgin answered, quote, My spouse and my master, let not thy kindest heart be afflicted, because the ardent wishes which the love of thy Lord excites in thee cannot be fulfilled. Since I bear him in my womb, let us, I beseech thee, give thanks for having disposed events in this way. The place of which thou speakest shall be most satisfactory to me. Let thy tears of sorrow be turned into tears of joy, and let us lovingly embrace poverty, which is the inestimable and precious treasure of my most holy son. Inestimable. Inestimable. Okay, sorry. He came from heaven in order to seek it, let us then afford him an occasion to practice it in the joy of our souls. Certainly I cannot be better delighted than to see thee procure it for me. Let us go gladly wherever the Lord shall guide us." Unquote. The holy angels accompanied the heavenly pair, <coughs> brilliant, brilliantly lighting up the way. And when they arrived at the city gate, they saw that the cave was forsaken and unoccupied. Full of heavenly consolation, they thanked the Lord for this favor, and then happened what I shall relate in the following chapter. Whoops. In 
instruction with the, which the Most Holy Mary, the Queen of Heaven, gave me. My dearest daughter, if thou art of meek, if thou art of a meek and docile heart, these mysteries which thou hast written about and hast understood will stir within thee sweet sentiments of love and affection toward the author of such great wonders. I wish that, bearing them in mind, thou from this day on embrace with new and great esteem the contempt and neglect of the world. And tell me, dearest, if in exchange for these, this forgetfulness and scorn of the world, God look upon thee with eyes of sweetest love, why shouldest thou not buy so cheaply what is worth an infinite price? What can the world give thee, even when it esteems thee and exalts thee most? And what dost thou lose if thou despise it? Is its favor not all vanity and deceit? Psalms 4, 3. Is it not all a fleeting and momentary shadow which eludes the grasp of those that haste after it? Hence, if thou hadst all worldly advantage in thy possession, what great feat would it be to despise it as of no value? Consider how little thou dost in rejecting all of it for the love of God, for mine and that of the holy angels. And if the world does not neglect thee as much as thou shouldest desire, do thou on thy own behalf despise it, in order to remain free and unhampered to enjoy to the full extent the highest good with the plenitude of his most delightful love and intercourse. My most holy son is such a faithful lover of souls that he has set me as the teacher and living example of the love of humility and true contempt of worldly vanity and pride. He ordained also for his own glory as well as for my sake that I, his servant and mother, should be left without shelter and be turned away by mortals in order that afterwards his beloved souls might be so much the more readily induced to offer him a welcome, thus obliging him, by an artifice of love, to come and remain with them. He also sought destitution and poverty, not because he had any need of them for bringing the practice of virtues to the highest perfection, but in order to teach mortals the shortest and surest way for reaching the heights of divine love and union with God. Thou knowest well, my dearest, that thou hast been incessantly instructed and exhorted by divine enlightenment to forget the terrestrial and visible and to gird thyself with fortitude, Proverbs 31, 17, to raise thyself to the imitation of me, copying in thyself, according to thy capacity, the works and virtues manifested to thee in my life. <clears throat> this is the very first purpose of the knowledge which thou receivest in writing this history, for thou hast in me a perfect model, and by it thou canst arrange the converse and conduct of thy life in the same manner as I arranged mine in imitation of my sweetest son. The dread with which this command to imitate me has inspired thee as a being above thy strength, as 